now and hand over to Sarinda and John Mills. So Sarinda, over to you. Thanks, Ellen. So my name is Sarinda Kaur Kurotana and I am a service designer, but I've done a lot of design work around catalog, um, the service catalog in, in my time. And my time hasn't been, you know, years and years um, of extensive kind of design work. I've only been in the IT industry for about six years now, but it's been quite an intense six years and, and I must admit I have learned a lot about the catalogue. So um, this is my second session on the catalogue. So the last one was about how to promote an effective service catalogue. We're going back to basics on how to build a service catalogue in this session. So I'm hoping it will enlighten people. So um, yeah, um, I'll pass you on to John for him to give you an intro as well. Hi everybody, John Mills. Um, similar background, I've just been in uh, the IT industry a little bit longer, I think. Um, I've seen the growth of a service catalogue right from the early days to um, to what it is now. So I, I wanted to kind of join this and be a supporting role for Surinder through this. Okay. Right, am I right to start? Yeah? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, great. So um, first of all, I'm just going to go into the actual definition of what a service catalogue is. I appreciate that there are probably people on here that have, have not had much exposure and then there's people probably who have had a lot of exposure. So um, just for everyone's benefit, the service catalogue is the only part of the ITIL service portfolio that's published to customers and is used to support the sale and delivery of IT services. The service catalogue includes information about deliverables, prices, contract points, ordering and request processes. Processes are very important um, as part of a service catalogue, but it's not what I'm going to hone into during um, our session today because we're looking at the actual um, steps to get to what the processes should be or what the processes entail in BAU, for example. So. Um, I mean, feel free to ask questions at the end of the session and, and I'll be happy to go into a bit more detail. Okay, so what's important when, um, when you're building a service catalog is always asking the right questions. And what I find is if the right questions are not being asked and I'm not by any means suggesting that these are absolutely the indefinite questions that should be asked, um, there is, with, with anything, there is a process that you go through in terms of getting to some point in time um, in, with the catalog, getting it to, um, you know, transition into operations, for example, or publishing it. But if, and I found this in my very first project, if the right questions are not asked to begin with, you find yourself going back and forth and, and it just gets very, very hard um, and, it can impact finances as well in terms of money, um, you know, be, being wasted in a way, because that's what I found. So it's kind of streamlining the process in your head as a service catalog manager or a designer, for example, which I've been um, in my time whilst I've worked in, in IT. So my questions are, I mean, I have five here you know, you can have seven or eight, 10, whatever, but these are the five that I thought were the most relevant to today's session. First of all, highlighting your customer, understanding the customer and what your customer actually wants. I'll go into more detail. And secondly, what are the most important business processes? Make sure you know what your business processes are in terms of how you execute things into a catalog, not just processes as a standalone and then your catalog as a standalone thing. So look at how you can bring the two together. Uh, thirdly, are your services mapped to these? So this kind of follows on from my second one to the third one and the fourth one now, are your services currently defined? SLAs are very important. So this all th this has to happen, you know, a part of strategy and design, I, I guess, and to get you to actually look at how your SLAs are going to fit in. Again, I will go into a bit more detail on the next slide with the SLAs. 
So these are six steps to building a service catalog that I, I've identified in my time as, um, as a service designer, for example. Um, so the first four steps are very important in terms of how we build a service catalog. Step five and six, I would say, are more um, around the processes and more around how, um, how you actually execute the service. So how you publish the service catalog. So first of all, identifying your stakeholders. Now, it's very, very important to identify who these people are going to be and who these stakeholders are, understanding what the processes are. Get um, you know, your service catalog manager on board. Understand um, that the service catalog manager or the owner of the service catalog is the person that will actually look after this. So you know, treat it as if it's a baby. Um, and it grows as it goes on. So working out who that person is, who that first point of contact is, is very important within an organization. And I have, uh, for my sins, worked in organizations where service catalog managers have been absent and have been recruited further down in the process, by which point any kind of authority or responsibility is kind of lost. So it's really important to identify who these people are, who your stakeholders are, who your customer is, you know, counterparts within the organizations respectively. Um, and once these stakeholders have been um, identified, it's important to then get the racy going. So who's responsible, who's accountable, who, um, you know, is being consulted and informed once the racing model is in place at that point in time, I think you've already set yourself up for success to some large extent. Not having that again, I've had taste of that, is not a very good idea, in my humble opinion. You may disagree, but that's how the foundations are set. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an example. So building something, building, I don't know, a tower block or something, if you don't have the architectural design, to work that tower block up to what it's supposed to be it's never going to be fit for purpose right it's going to fall over at some point same thing with the catalog so it's very important to make sure um you know to, in order to get the ball rolling that this first point is very very important and it kind of is the foundation of how you build secondly moving on to defining the lines of service make sure that your customer or your client is is aware of what the lines of service are. I'll use an example here, something we can all relate to. So when we go out to the restaurant, for example, we haven't been to one for a long time, I, I guess, but your menu has appetizers, uh, main course and dessert on it, right? So you know that you, you're gonna order your appetizer from from this side of the menu, your main course in the middle and your dessert comes last. There's a, a clear kind of, um, you know, a clear cut view of what the service, each service looks like. So you've got three there, for example. Similar in the service catalog, define the lines of service and understand how you're going to actually present them. So this is more about the look and feel of a catalog, I guess. Um, understanding, you know, how is this gonna look to, to the end user and how would it look to the consumer? So it's really important to get those those um, those service lines defined by with the customer and understand how you would perhaps execute them. Um, the only one other point I'm going to make on that is um, communication is important and it's very important to talk to your customer about how you're going to do that. It's no good you saying to the customer, "Here's what I think you should have," because you've got to always remember. It goes back to John's session of last week where we were talking about design thinking. Understand that this design is actually, um, you know, ultimately going to be for the customer. So putting yourself in the customer's shoes and seeing it from their perspective. And of course, going back and saying, okay, we can do it, but we can do it like this or this or this. So whatever you have. Thirdly, create a service catalog template. Now, nine times out of 10, you haven't got a service catalog template, the catalog will fall over. And I can say that, again, it's something I've seen in the past. Um, service catalog templates are very easy to create. Um, and if somebody would like to see one or, or understand how it, how it works and all the rest of it, I have all of that. So please feel free to reach out to me in terms of how 
um, to execute that. But service catalog template is something that you can standardize and use again and again on various projects, not just one service catalog. So you, it's something that you have. So it's well worth investing your time in creating one. So you have one that can, you can use for more or less any service. And this will have information such as, you know, the description of a service catalog item, the, the name, the description, um, you know, SLA, that's the most important information in the service catalog um, template. I see um, for a service catalog item because SLAs drive so much more. Um, and I'll go into a bit more detail about that as well. So, for example, your service desk is something that's always going to look to demonstrate value to your organization. So it's very important that you create something like, you know, a, well, a platform. So a service catalog for, for it to sit in either, you know, I don't know, remedy service now, whatever um, platform you choose. I've used the likes of Kinetic, which is like a front end and then a back end using um, Remedy, for example. So there's various ways you can execute a service catalog away from what most organizations have is either a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet. So the longer you, know, you, you spend using very simple tools such as um, you know, a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet, the harder it is for your service desk to actually um, you know, give value to your organization. So it's very important that, you know, you invest time and resources and money into developing something which is possibly going to save money, um, you know, in the long term. And I talk about, I talk about money a lot because I've looked at streamlining processes as well in order to save the business, um, you know, from X number of, of service credits, for example. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, you know, when looking into how how your template is defined and how to manage it, make sure the service owner is responsible for uh, executing the um, contents of the service catalog template. Okay, fourth point, define um, and categorize your services. So for before you categorize any service, I think it's very important to start, it is very important to define what those services are. Again, this is your opportunity to execute the first part of it. Um, you know, your service catalog stakeholders have been identified. Now's your chance to get them into a room and say, look guys, here is what we have. Can we have you define and categorize these services? A lot of the stakeholders in the room may not know what, you know, a definition is, for example, or how to define these, these um, services. And then what is categorizing? So, this is um, ultimately for the service catalog owner or the, or the service catalog manager to sit in the room and say, look, this is what it is and, and bring that whole piece together. Um, consulting and understanding, you know, what are the most used services that you already have? For example, if you are using a, a, an Excel spreadsheet, is there something on there which is, is, is used more frequently? What are, you know, your, your most common requests, for example? So this is the kind of information to collate before you go into these focus groups or these workshops to, to then present to the customer and understand what, what they would like and what information you already have. So this is where you can use your reporting skills, um, you know, in terms of how you get, okay, this is, um, I'm going to use an example here, you know, um, ordering a mouse, a mouse is ordered, is the most frequent um, request in a catalog. So, um, you know, how would you like your software to be um, categorized? How would you like your hardware to be categorized? Um, I don't know, manage print services or, or, or print services, whatever you have. And then you can actually go into details such as um, creating various navigational categories as well. But this is going into very low level detail, which I can go into, but for the benefit of um, today's session, I'm just going to keep it to defining and categorizing services. Again, if somebody wants to have that low level detail, I can provide that. Okay, so this is a point where you can kind of celebrate. Um, you're almost there, but not quite. So you can like, you can have your cake at this point after executing point four, but 
five and six are equally as important, but I don't categorize them more as a build, but it's, it's something that you need to actually be mindful of. Otherwise, um, steps one, two, three, and four are kind of irrelevant if five and six are not executed. So step five is the most important part. So you can have, um, you can have a service catalog, um, you know, and, and be super proud of it. But if it's not published to the customer, then it's kind of useless, right? It's just going to sit there. It's not going to do anything. So again, as I said in the first instance with the first slide, the service catalog is the only thing that is actually published to the customer for the customer to consume. So if it's not, there's no point in doing it. So it has to be published. So this is why we have six steps and not four. So here, the only one thing I want to say is that there is, a, and, and this is from experience, so I've always looked at role-based access. Again, I'm going into a bit of, um, of, low level, of the low-level detail here. So role-based access, RBAG, um, would mitigate some, some issues. For example, if you're given access to, to one uh, group of people, which are for, for today's um, presentation, I will call group A and there's group B. So group A would have a different view to group B, for example. So group A would, you know, say, wouldn't ever say to you, um, why can't I order, you know, shared access to a drive, for example, or why can I place that request for shared access? Well, they can't ever see it, so they, they wouldn't have that issue if you have role-based access in place. The only reason I touch upon this very lightly today is because, again, when I say there are steps to execute something, it's very important that this step takes into account the role-based access, if that's something you're looking at doing. You can have just a, a catalog, you know, that has access to everything for everyone. It's entirely up to you and the organization. But I would highly suggest and recommend that you look at role-based access as well. But again, that can be further down the line, but it's something to think about. Okay, so the last step here is to integrate the process and practice CSI. So looking at policy and how often you, you're going to, for example, review the service catalog and integrate your service catalog um, you know, with your ITSM platform, again, I go back to, you know, I I think it's primitive, and but I'm only talking about six years ago when I first started to work for a financial organization. I would have actually thought they would have something in place which would execute requests, but they worked off um, an Excel spreadsheet. And it was so tedious. And it was almost as I had, I'd gone back into the 90s, um, you know, and things were so like, um, primitive in terms of how this actual Excel spreadsheet was populated and and how a request was executed it would take in my head it was taking years to do whereas one click would actually you know mitigate so much risk as well of um, you know typos for example or I don't know the spreadsheet just being lost into the ether which happened a lot as well so and these are the things we need to think about. I mean, you know, it's 2020. We live in a world which is changing so uh, quickly and is, is, is very dynamic. So, again, you know, think of your catalog as something that is dynamic. It's never going to be something which is static. It's always going to change. Look, to ways, uh, look at ways to improve it um, as you go on. So, you know, practicing CSI is something which people forget sometimes because once it's been published, people think that's it. Or I say the service catalog manager in this case or the owner would think, okay, my job's done now. I just need to babysit this thing. It's not. We should always thrive and look to, um, you know, creating something better. Again, perhaps look at automation when you get to that point. But one thing I will say is when you're first actually setting the catalog up, don't go into the whole IT mode, I'm going to automate everything because it may not match your requirements that you have set with the um, with your customer. Um, you know, it may not actually work for it may not work for the purpose of what, what you're trying to achieve. So it's very important to to make sure that, you know, you look at what you're actually trying to deliver in terms of how you set the catalog process out. 
I was asked to look at automation in my last one that I did um, a couple of years back. I, automation was actually contractual. So um, that was something that I had identified with the stakeholders. So the first step, we'd looked at automation and how it was going to work. But because I'd already touched automation, automation I knew that it wasn't a risk I was taking. So I, I was 100% sure that I would do this and it would work, and it did. But um, auto provisioning catalog items, for example, is a big thing. So again, having had having done that before, it was easier for me to do that the second time. Um, so it's about having confidence in, in what you're actually trying to deliver to the customer and understanding that automation isn't going to fix something uh, which is perhaps broken or it's not going to streamline your processes. You have to know what you're trying to automate and understand whether it will work or not. So um, remember the catalog is something that evolves and improves. So don't, again, don't treat it like, okay, it's done and that's it, chapter closed. It's never like that. And the last thing I'm going to say on that um, last point is I made, um, I kind of worked out uh, with, with my reports once, um, you know, my top 10 um, requests were whatever they were at the time. Um, and I actually published those on, on the web page just as my 10 greatest hits, for example. Um, because I think having something like that, it kind of gives the customer a bit more confidence. It also gives the user a very good experience. So again, looking at it from a UX um, you know, perspective, if I'm if um, you know, ordering um, a monitor is something that happens regularly or a mouse, I think mice, mice are more, more regular than monitors. Um, you know, that would be one of, of um, one of the top 10. So look at publishing things like that, make it different, but understand what it is you're trying to make it different with some tangible um, information or some numbers and, and make sure it's backed by your reports. So don't try and risk it or don't try and um, kind of look to do something which you don't actually have much knowledge um, about or with. Um, make sure there's something you know that, that backs it up from the end user's perspective, which here is your customer. Um, the only one point, um, the last point I'm going to make here is always go back to your customer and get feedback. So I don't know, satisfaction surveys are important to understand where the catalog is perhaps falling over and where you can look to um, improve and develop going forward. It can only get better, right, if it's not working. So that's something that I always did because if you don't know, you're none the wiser and you're just going to think it works and it's okay. And you could actually be burdening your service desk with a lot of incidents, for example, on the back of something that's broken that could be fixed. So again, it's something to bear in mind, but again, comes out of conversation with your customer and perhaps doing those surveys with them. So these are very six important um, steps to building a service catalog. And this is more or less all it is before you get to actually doing the build. So these steps will take you, <clears throat> you know, from um, talking to your stakeholders to actually publishing and um, publishing the service catalog and practicing, you know, your um, CSIs moving on. So, these are just um, example elements I have with the service catalog. So you may ask, well, what goes into that template, for example? So th these are the points I wanted to make because I actually wanted to make it relatable. So again, this is a slide from my last presentation. So service description, just a brief description of what the service is in business language, because, um, you know, it, it's, it's not something that's going to a lay person off the street. So make sure it's you know i mean you can go back to your customer and work the wording out with them so you know that's something that you come to um you know happy medium with your customer service level service level agreement so every service should clearly describe the agreed service level so this can be contractual this can be something you agree with um however you choose to do it nine times out of ten again it's it's usually something contractual Look at support. 
every service should describe how how the business uh, customer should report problems or make requests so that's more or less in kind of brought into your or encompassed into your processes very important point service conditions set an expectation for any specific um, term of usage operation maintenance change periods again you can work with your change team your operations team to work out service conditions if they're not again this is something which is already laid out in terms of design at the very beginning so you should already have this information if you haven't and it's a gap go back and make sure you have it before you proceed because it could be a pitfall otherwise cost um every service should establish um, its actual or national cost to the customer cost is something which is in the service catalog but it, sometimes it's it's not visible to the end user because obviously the end user is not actually paying for it, but it's the business. So um, it could be visible to the end user. It could not be. That's something you agree with. So these are the kind of discussions or um, conversations you have with your, um, with your customer in terms of how you're going to deliver it. So it goes back to the look and feel of a catalog features and functions. Um, this, um, would probably just be a description in terms of you know what value is it going to bring to your customer so um i'm just going to tap into something here just before i move on to the next point um in my time i've been asked to deliver something to the customer which is giving them an amazon you know service type of experience so we've all well, i'm assuming we've all ordered something from amazon so we know how it's done and and what it looks like so this is the example um i, I give because the customer has come back to me and asked me to do that whether it's been within budget or not is a different story but i've had to um, execute that so you know it's more about understanding what you're actually asked to do by the customer and whether it fills the actual um fulfills the actual criteria and, and requirements part of it but again, is it within budget? If they're asking you to do an Amazon type of experience, but paying you to give them, you know, just a normal Excel spreadsheet experience type of thing, it's not gonna work, right? So these are conversations for you to have with your um, client or customer in terms of understanding what is it that they actually want. Again, I was going back to, I just had a thought, I was going back to the conversation from design thinking session earlier on last week. Be assertive. If you know that you can't execute the Amazon type of experience, you know, go back to the customer and say, well, it's with, it's not within budget, so it's not going to happen, but I can give you this. Right. Um, last point here is related services. So, um, <clears throat> in, um, sometimes I look at this as part of the, um, the categorization, uh, function of it. So also, you know, linking your services, um, again, it goes back to design. I don't really want to go into design of a catalog because we're talking about how to build one here, but it ultimately kind of links together. So if um, there are other areas of your service catalog that provide, you know, something which, you know, kind of over, overlaps with something else, look at how you can bring that together. So um, one example I will use here is, bundling for example i did something with the client with my last client um it was it, it was quite going into very low level detail and it was quite convoluted what i did in the design of it um i went into bundling a service catalog so you can get your monitor mouse and i don't know whatever else there is so let's use monitor and mouse as an example or you could just order a monitor respectively or a mouse respectively but bundling would bring the two together right so giving the customer an option of here's what you could do you know providing with it it's within budget of course um and making sure that you know there are um things that streamline the process as well so think about processes as a service catalog owner or manager understand whether the processes that you're actually executing bring together something or just streamline something before you even get it to publishing state so again it's something you know to think about so lastly i have here i just a um i've just taken a screenshot of a blackberry i'm sure no one has a blackberry anymore i don't even think businesses use 
these <laughs> wireless devices, a BlackBerry wireless device anymore. So, but anyway, here we have um, the look of what it, you know, um, a form could look like in the service catalog to order that device. Um, and, uh, you know, that there are many ways to break this down as well. Again, that's something I can go into um, with a bit more detail um, upon request. But um, that's basically it. So open to questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarinda. Uh, you did a great presentation um, in that there are so many questions, right? So there are some privately to me, a lot of them open in the public. So we have about 18 questions to get through. So you might need a bit of water <laughs> Or something to just you know get through all this but um and you know more questions will will come in so before we do that though um as i mentioned to everyone right at the very beginning could i just take this opportunity please to ask you to turn your uh, webcams on and just to give us a wave especially if you're enjoying this session just so we have it captured so i'd really appreciate you all doing that there's 10 seconds of your time thank you all as I was saying in the last session as well, this, this is going to make you famous, right? It won't, it won't be on the BBC or anything, but anyway. So thank you. Thank you all. Um, so let's get to the questions. Um, so the first one, uh, and, and some of these, by the way, Sarinda, have already been uh, responded to in the chat as well. But it'll be good to just uh, have a verbal conversation around them. So the first one is, is it mandatory to have SLAs in the service catalog? And this is one of your, the earliest points you had covered. So what's your view around SLAs and the service catalog? Yeah, 100% mandatory. Um, it's mandatory, but obviously I know I, I have been in businesses where there have been SLAs missing. If there are, just go back and make sure you have something in there. Agree it with the customer. The thing is, if there are no SLAs in the catalog or if there are SLAs missing, again, it goes back to my point of you're going to burden the service desk with with you know i'll give you an end user type of scenario here so i've ordered my mouse right i'm sat here waiting for my mouse i don't know when this mouse is going to arrive because there's no sla attached to my request that goes back to the catalog so as a user you know it tells me it'll be um delivered for example within 48 hours or whatever but it doesn't arrive for the next 72 I'm going to be very annoyed, you know, in four days time or five days time when this mouse is not rocked up because I can't do anything. Right. You then encroach into territory where incidents will be raised and, and it burdens your service desk. So if you want to add value to an organization, you make sure that those SLAs are in there because if they're in there, then you just, you leverage your service catalog for a start and you then mitigate the risk of any incidents coming on the back of that. You may think it's a mouse, who cares? Well, I'm sorry, as a service catalog manager and an owner, I care a lot. And this is really important. So to answer the question, 100% mandatory. Right. Very strong on that one. Thanks, Sarinda. Yeah, um, yeah. So absolutely. So let me move on to the next one. Um, and I'll try and get through four or five of these questions and then we'll open it up to a verbal discussion as well. And then I'll go back to the chat afterwards. Okay, uh, keep your questions coming in if you want. Uh, so the next one, when you have a large number of conflicting items to be built, what tools, techniques could be used to prioritize which ones you build first? Okay, so my question is, what do we mean by conflicting? Because in terms of a service catalog, to my mind, if the service catalog has been designed um, or the strategy of the service catalog has been agreed with the customer, those kind of things or, or any conflicts would have been resolved before we even get to the build stage. So that's the first point I have. And again, this person can come back to me directly because I'd like more clarity on what conflict is. Tools, um, so what I have done in the past is not necessarily use tools, but I've done a lot of reporting around existing legacy catalogs, for example looking at them to understand, okay, there's um, some requests, um, I can't think off the top of my head, um, that have never been used, or maybe one order per 18 months or, or something, again, is an example. I'm not gonna, gonna stick that into my new catalog because it's hardly ever touched upon. So you have to keep it very clean, right? So in order to do that, 
understand what is actually happening. What are the dynamics of the catalog to make sure that when you bring something new into it, if you're, if you are creating something new or if it's a legacy catalog, because a lot of businesses I know are on legacy systems, taking it on to, you know, for example, service now, what's going on in, in your legacy world, what's going on in this old world and what are you going to actually take out and get rid of um, in order to, you know, perhaps streamline something. So, uh, for this person asking the question one, you know, conflict, something that would have been resolved before you even get to the build stage. If you've done the, the design work around the catalog properly. Um, secondly, tools, it doesn't take much. I mean, if you've got, even if you've got an Excel spreadsheet, you can still work out what's being utilized and what's not being utilized. I hope I've answered that question. If I haven't, please come to me and, and I, I can, I can go into a bit more detail, but I need to understand what the conflict is. Yeah, and, and I, so we may have time to come back to that anyway later on, right? So I'll just keep going through the questions that were asked in chat and we may have time. But um, Sarinda, I'll just add what, one point to what you were saying, and I think you covered it, but it's about prioritization maybe, and you talked about that's something that you should do in the scoping out before you even begin building the catalog. But of course, yeah. this person may have, may be thinking specifically about application tools, you know, system tools, but yeah, they can reach out to you on a one-to-one -one basis. Your email is there anyway, yeah. right? So let me yeah. move us on. Um, so next one um, is, I guess, kind of linked to the one we've just asked. And it's um, and this was asked when someone was registering uh, for the session, actually, which I'll raise now. And essentially what this person wrote was, we have different entries to the catalog items versus the global splash page for 80, 85,000 employees. Does that make sense? So different entries to the catalog item in, in comparison to the splash page. So maybe the back end catalog, like the technical catalog and the business catalog. What's your view about that and the differences there? Okay, so um, I'm not too familiar with the, the splash back terminology. So I, I, I'm not really sure of what what's going on there, but how I would see, okay, so there are always I always make a point of, of publishing two catalogs, right? So one has, um, what well, one is to the user, the, the, the user can see directly. And then sometimes businesses like an internal catalog just to utilize or consume internally. So um, it's important to do a gap analysis as well. That's something that I've always made sure is done, even when you're presenting to two different audiences. But I think, in terms of what requirements are for one catalog and what they are for the, the other one, they again, the thing is with the catalog, um, if you've got an issue like that going on, chances are that the requirements have not been agreed or um, defined to begin with in terms of how it's going to look and feel to the various audiences respectively. So I think it goes back to my earlier point of, you know, what happened when your stakeholders were identified and, and what conversations took place then. Um, again, it's something that evolves. So perhaps go back and look at where, you know, where the gap is and do a gap analysis on it. Again, that's something that's very easy and quick to do, right? You, there are many tools that, that will allow you to do that as well. Work out where the gap is and, and how that can be fixed. But two different um, kind of um, looks to the catalog are uh, usually because you're presenting to two different types of audiences. So they will have a different feel and there could be some catalog items in one catalog that are not present in the second one because it was purely something that was agreed uh, with the customer in the initial um, you know, design phase or, or where the strategy was actually being implemented. So again, it's dependent on what has been agreed and the requirements. And I like to stress, just as I did with the SLAs, requirements are absolutely mandatory and very important for your catalog to work otherwise you know i i understand questions like this come in and and then it becomes harder to go and fix it because to me it seems like a broken thing right now um evolving something yes perfect fine but if something is broken and it's not being fixed and you're plastering it that is inevitably going to cause again burden on your service desk so the requirements are important and I hope I've answered that one as well because if the requirements have been defined and, and not executed in your design for the service catalogue then again 
you will see problems in, for example, early life support or when you transition that service into um, operations. Okay, and so let me move us on then. So this is a quick, easy one for you, Surinder, just to give you a brief, some breathing space. So uh, there were two questions asked around templates and whether you can share them. So if you have templates, so if people reach out to you, are you able to share some templates? Yes, of course. I, uh, I have kind of some very simple templates. Again, it goes back to, um, you know, I'll keep this brief, um, how, how um, complex your design is. So depending on what you're asking me for is, is what I can provide you with. But I have some very simple templates. If you're um, a person who's actually working from an Excel spreadsheet um, service request catalog, then you'll get the basic template. Whereas if you're going to look to transition onto ServiceNow or Remedy, whatever, then, you know, we can go into some detail with that, but I have some. Okay, great. And there are two questions uh, around ownership, which I'll combine into one, and then I'll open it up to some verbal questions. So these were around, let me just find them. And John, I guess you might want to come in on some of these as well. So these are two questions, but as I said, I'll group them together. So who is primarily responsible to create and manage a service catalog in an organization? Does the service debt, so the second part of the question is, does the service desk lead play the role of service catalog owner? So who is responsible for creating and managing service catalog? And another person asked, is it the service desk? What's your view around that, Surinder? And then maybe John, you, you can answer as well. Okay, so as I was saying, um, last week in the, in the design um, session, it's important to have a designer within an organization to execute the design, right? So simply, you need a service catalog owner or a process owner for a service catalog to have their two pens every time um, th there's been questions raised or, um, you know, the stakeholders are not agreeing on something. They have ultimate responsibility of executing that service. Therefore, they have complete privilege to be 101% um, in control of what they're doing. Um, I would really, really urge organizations that don't have a service catalog specialist, owner, manager, whatever you want to call it, in their organization to hire one to make sure that it's looked after. Because a service catalog is probably one of your biggest services or your larger services along with incidents. So you wouldn't have incidents being managed without an incident manager. So why would you have a service catalog without a service catalog manager? I don't know. It, it baffles me that some organizations don't, but hey. Yeah. Um, okay, I? but, and, and just maybe, John, if you could pick this one up then, as you know, so that, that question, like Surinder's obviously already covered it and covered it well uh, by saying, why wouldn't you have one? Uh, but the bit about, well, should it be your service desk that owns the service catalog? Yeah, so look, I think this is a really, really lazy option. Um, I think, I think in my experience, it's tended to be the service desk seems to interact with it the most. So that seems the logical place to put it. And it's also, it's, it's quite a burden then on, on that, on that function. So in light of there being nothing, there's better to have something absolutely. And them having contact with it all the time pre creates that kind of um, logical attach. But I agree with Serena there. I, it needs an owner and the best option, the best practice option is to actually hire someone or identify someone in the organization that's going to look after this. And it could be in a Siam perspective. It could be in a, you know, another process owner as well that does a joint role, but it's ownership and you have one person to go to them. Okay, great. Right. So let's open it up now to see if any of you have a follow-up question to something that's already been asked or if there's another question that you do want to ask. Anyone want to unmute themselves? Hey, hi, Surinder. This is Rajendra. Am I audible? Ah, yes, you are. Hi, Rajendra. Hi. Hey, uh, Surinder, uh, uh, it's a follow-up on the initial question I had posed about uh, prioritizing. So I may have uh, put the conflicting word, which probably uh, created a little bit of confusion. But keeping the co conflicting things aside, uh, when when you open the service catalog requirements to uh, the business, everyone starts coming up with saying, "Yes, I want this. I want this. I want that. I want that." And and uh, 
with a with a limited bandwidth of uh, developing those service catalog items you can only deliver so much in in a given uh, point of time so mm -hmm. so in such cases uh, how do you uh, make sure that we are giving the right order of priority to uh, those service catalog items which which we are receiving uh, from from the requesters that was my um, yeah. intent of asking that question okay so right. primarily around prioritization then agenda yes yes okay, okay. okay. yeah so um okay that that changes the question now right so um prioritization is important but my question is that if you've got a service catalog that you're trying to execute <coughs> sorry surely everything in that catalog is important to some large extent right but i'm going to give you one example here so i've worked in siam environments predominantly for, for the best part of my career in it and every time i've done a siam transition it's always done in waves or phases um i like to call it waves we can like we have in um you know design work we have the sprint so wave one wave two three and four is how i execute my last one so the last, um, this goes to your um, prioritization question, Rajendra, to understand that applications were something which weren't a priority, whereas voice and telephony were, right? Um, uh -huh. And as was um, bulk print and managed print services, the print services were important. So because print services are something that the business could not do without having it was it was a major priority so i'm bringing it back into phase one of that transition uh, telephony and voice um voice telephony um wan lan and all all of that jazz came into you know phase two so wave two was was then agreed these are things um or points you agree with the customer in terms of what they see as priority or what the business sees as priority so in my in my case applications were the last thing they wanted transition so it was the last thing that we actually worked on so these are conversations like i said it's important to have these um these workshops or um you know um, meetings with your customer understand what they actually want you to deliver and how they want you to deliver is, is a more important question in this instance because if you don't know what so if you don't know how you're going to deliver it then you know, I could have gone and, and delivered applications first and they would then be crying out for print services to be delivered and, and park the application. So understand what your customer wants, it goes back to, to what the demand is and then what you supply, right? So that is a conversation you, you have with the customer. So if, if printing goes first, printing goes first, voice and telephony second, that's how you work it out. These are conversations I had with my client to establish what and how I do it. So that's basically it. Yeah. Thanks, Arinda. Okay. Me Alim, I just, wanted yeah. to add, I just wanted to add on that as well. Just a really quick one, right? So, and it might clarify a little bit, is, and Sarinda touched on this before, if, if you're having an issue, go down the most requested path, right? So go down to what is being requested the most, right? And then quantify that or qualify that with your customer, as in don't assume, ask. Right, and then yep. and then there's a there's a good start. Yep, that's yeah. what I was looking for, John. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's look, good. <laughs> so I have um, I have a problem, right? So my problem is that we have eleven questions still and about ten minutes. So I can't we can't do a quick fire rounds, unfortunately. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and cover as many as I can. But I'm also in the chat now posting a slack link which many of you are already members of but if you're not please go to this slack area because you will find Sarinda and john mills and some of the other mentors living there and you can then have follow-up conversations with them one-to-one -one time with them okay but i will try and cover as many of the questions as i can so let me go on to the next one um how can you and maybe john if you could pick this one up how can you motivate service desk in achieving business success to customers with a service catalog so I guess motivating your service desk to encourage people using this to serve using the service catalog. Yeah, I'll be quick as I'll be quick as I can, right? So value. You've just got to push the value angle, right? So it makes their job easier, it makes it it makes setting expectations with a customer a lot easier, which in turn brings up customer satisfaction. So you've got to push that. You know, then you'll get buy into it and you'll make sure that their experience is a lot better, both sides. Okay. 
Thank you. The next Just one, one point, um, Alan, quickly is engage the service desk um, as a part of the first sprint as your um, your stakeholders, right? Do that, then you're fine. Fair enough. Yep, thank you. So this next question asks for five key reasons why service catalog builds fail. But if we could just cover three, please. Um, so we, and we can ask both of you, uh, Surinder. What John, if we so. do four and one each? And one each will go one to one. Go on then. Go on then. Go. What, what's um, Surinder? You go first. <laughs> why do service catalogs fail? Go on. Two each. Okay. Um, I've seen lack of templates. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to amalgamate the lack of um, SLAs or absence of SLAs and zero communication. Okay. Never do Thank that. You. Thank you. John? Mine is uh, we try and reinvent the wheel. So, um, you know, we try to create from the bottom up and start and there's millions out there. You can get a lot of examples out there already and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And the second one is start small and build. Don't go for Mount Olympus. Okay. So that's no, great, right? Because if you if you read the opposite of those, don't go big. Make sure you communicate, 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 and, and yeah, you get the future. So that was actually really good, right? Really helpful. Thanks for that. Let me move us on again, if I may. And um, how do we therefore measure the success of a service catalog? How do we know if we're successful? Who wants to pick that up? John? Oh, jeepers. <laughs> um so, so my in my experience, measuring the success of a catalog, it can, it can come down to your reporting, it'll help with the customer sat side of things, it'll help with um, the actual fulfillment of those, you know, so you can, you can definitely get statistics around, you know, before it was 10 days, now it's two days. You know, Sarinda touched on this before, without that expectation set, you don't know whether getting a mouse in two days was good because the SLA is six, or it's bad because the SLA was an hour, right? And you've taken two days, so really, really. Great, so let me uh, partly cover two previous questions we've covered before. And the question is essentially, a client has asked me to build the service catalog, uh, but they don't have a service catalog owner. Um, how do I ensure it's successful? So, you know, we've covered like reasons why service catalogs fails and service catalog owner before. So. What do you do? What do you advise in that situation? You're asked to build a catalog, but there's no service catalog owner. What, what do you do and how do you get that organization through that? Uh, either of you can answer this. Surinda. <laughs> okay, my question is to this person, um, my heart goes out to you to begin with. And secondly, um, I, I'd wanna understand what, what the person's remit is because Service catalog ownership, it, you know, you, I, I would say one would have to be a SME to understand the ins and outs of it and for it to be successful. I've gone into organizations where service catalog owners or process owners or managers have not managed it in the way it should be. And ultimately, it's going to fall over. Um, you know, it's something which is taken from design into, well, in assignment environments, taken from design, transition into operations, and it needs to have, it's being handheld the whole way through into um, operations. And if you, if that's not happening, it's gonna fall over and it's never gonna be successful. There are so many things that need to be looked into and agreed. As I said before, service catalog owners have the last say in everything in terms of how their actual build or the, the the service catalog is being promoted. If there's no one to do that, it's like having a project working without a project manager. It doesn't work, right? So it's not going to. It will always fall over and it will break. So if this person in question has other responsibilities and doesn't dedicate uh, one FTE to the catalog, it's not going to work. As simple as. Okay. So the next one is quite interesting. Takes us into the modern age in that the person asked. Um, must have must haves in redefining the service catalog and self service for the SaaS um, as a service era. So when it's a as a service, different partners delivering different parts. What, what's your view then in terms of how that catalog is is defined and the must haves? Okay, uh, SaaS or software as a service. 
um, this is a, a longer or broader kind of um, conversation to be had and I, I don't think I'm going to execute a very good answer in, in the time we have. Again, this person can come directly to me to ask me this again, but quickly. Um, so you've got to get everyone on board in terms of, um, you know, the, the stakeholders to understand what is actually being asked here. I go back to, to my point when I did SAS um, in, and execute that into the service catalogue. I was part of Scrum, daily Scrum. It was done in a very agile manner. Um, understanding in those Scrum sessions what the actual stakeholder wanted or needed from me as a, as a catalog owner at the time in terms of how to execute it. It's not as um, clear cut or defined as, for example, doing your print services um, or, I don't know, doing the one man execution, right? So it, it goes into a bit more detail. I have actually got some templates and um, other material on SAS um, for the catalog. So if somebody wants to reach out to me directly, then I can provide that too. Yeah, that's fair enough. And that's good to just uh, you know answer it briefly, but we'll move on. And it's Mohammed who's uh, also providing you know, some more information saying it's everything as a service, etc. But yeah, so reach out to Surinder specifically on that one, please. Let me move us on, if I may, again. Um, so this one's a great question. Um, I think it was from Tommy, if I recall. Um, I'm going to also post it in the chat uh, because there's quite a part to this question. So John and Surinder, you'll be able to see it, but I'll also read it out. So the question was asked, we have a service catalog which has somewhat failed. Why? Several reasons. We have only defined two levels of SLA, one uh, quite premium, one extremely basic. Uh, since no product owner would like to categorize their service as unimportant, close to all services have been bound to the premium SLA, right? So that's the, the issue they have, which in turn does not help service desk product owner and system responsible since they are given no help with priorities. And then Tommy's asking, is this a classic mistake? Now, Sarinda and John, I know this will require, you know, more, more detail. You know, Tommy can reach out to you directly, perhaps. But just what's your view on, look, two SLAs? Everyone, of course, wants to be on the important SLA. Uh, and is this a classic mistake? And how, I guess it comes back to SLAs. How many do you have? Do you, do you have 20 different SLAs or two? And, you know, what, what's your view there? John, do you want to get this one? Do you want me to? Um, no, no, you go, you go. Okay, so I, I keep stressing how important it is to have SLAs. So you, it's really difficult because I, it, I have been a, a catalog owner in my time. If someone's telling me that there are two separate SLAs and one is this uh, premium SLA, which I've never heard of, but one is just this other SLA, I don't know what, what you refer to it as, but... Um, my question would be, as a service owner or service catalog owner, um, my question would be, why is this happening in the first instance, right? So ultimately, I'm actually thinking about the service desk here. We're going to create burden on the service desk. All the end user is going, not going to be happy. So question it, interrogate it at a very early stage. If it's not right when it's gone in, it doesn't matter. It's not the end of the world. You can still fix it. But go back to the business and ask the business, why have we got these two, two separate SLAs? This is a classic failure scenario, and it's not ever going to be fixed if the conversations are not had. So my, um, my kind of um, advice to the person asking this question would be, go back to the business and actually agree on one SLA. Um, you know, and one SLA does not have, mean that we have that one SLA for all services. It just doesn't work like that. These are things that need to be agreed with the customer and look at having various turnaround times in the, in the catalog as well. SLAs, turnaround times, two different things. Again, I can go into a bit more detail with that. Um, well, I can go into a lot more detail, low level detail. If this person wants to reach out to me afterwards, they're more than welcome to, and I can actually expand on that. But my initial reaction to the question is, go back to the business and agree on an SLA, which is, you know, something that everyone understands and is actually legitimate and is not something which is, you know, 10 days to deliver a mouse. Okay. 
Thanks, Serena. So look, um, there are a couple more questions, but I think overall on the presentation and the follow-up stuff that you've said and everything we've covered, we've largely covered all of the questions. We are out of time, but I just want to give people a chance that if they have a follow-up question to something Serena or John have said, or want to ask a new question, please unmute yourself now and, and ask before you know, we, we finish the session. So anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a follow-up question, please do so now. John? Yeah, I have a quick question, Karthik here. Hi, Karthik, yes. Hi, um, when, when we talk about, I'm, I'm not very familiar with this topic, but I could relate to some of the use cases I could, uh, from my experience where we use service catalogs like uh, for the IT uh, production system of IT production support, we would definitely need an SLD and all those stuff so where we would require uh, a service catalog. And uh, if, if I'm right, we, we might also, I'm just thinking loud and see if, if it might be applicable for an online marketplace like eBay or Amazon, where we would list all the fee services and have a contract. I mean, do you, I mean, can you just throw some light on it for me to understand better what are the other possible use cases where we could use service catalog? Do you want me to get that, John? Um, I'll quickly go for it. Just So it's, a service catalog is just a list of services, right? It's the things that you can get from IT. And then that service catalog definition or the information inside it is is all the detail around um, when, why, how, um, how much, stuff like that, right? So it's, for, it's to clarify for the business what they can get from IT. And that's normally being agreed up front. Yeah. Thanks, John. I think that answers the question, right? Um, so Surinder, unless you have anything else to add, um, I will take the time to thank Surinder and John. We've had lots of good feedback in the chat and to me privately. So thank you all. I hope you uh, appreciated it. I provided the Slack link. So if you want to uh, connect with Surinda or John directly, please use that and do so. On that note, thank you all. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your questions. Hope you enjoyed it.